When it comes to the history of prominent figures, one name looms with a haunting legacy, Dr. James Marion Sims. Behind his seemingly prestigious title of the father of gynecology lies a shocking tale of horror and exploitation that will send chills down your spine. In this video, we'll dive deep into the dark and chilling past uncovering the untold story of Dr. Sims' sinister gynecological experiments on enslaved women. We will shed light on the unspeakable atrocities these women endured as we reveal the disturbing truth behind their suffering. From body mutilation to brutal experimentation, we'll navigate the horrors of this part of history that have been deliberately concealed for so long. As we explore this haunting chapter of history, you will gain a profound understanding of the persevering spirit of these women who endured unspeakable torment in the name of medical progression. In this period of slavery, female slaves endured unimaginable hardships as they faced a unique set of challenges that set them apart from their male counterparts. They were stripped of their freedom, dignity, and autonomy, and they were subjected to physical, emotional, and sexual abuse, bearing the weight of dual oppression, gender, and race. Working in grueling conditions on plantations, female slaves were forced to toil long hours in the fields enduring back-breaking labor under the merciless whip of their masters. In addition to their labor, they were expected to fulfill the roles of caregivers, cooking, cleaning, and raising children despite the constant threat of separation from their families due to slavery. The female slave's experience was further compounded by the horrors of sexual exploitation. Masters and overseers often subjected them to sexual abuse and violence exploiting their vulnerability and powerlessness. These acts of brutality not only inflicted pain, but also left emotional scars that haunted these women for generations. Throughout their vulnerable lives, these women endured countless hardships, starting from their birth and lasting through their teenage years and adulthood. Tragically, many of them were used as sex slaves on breeding farms by their heartless owners. Their struggles were worsened by the limited access to health care, especially during childbirth. Historical accounts revealed that enslaved women were unjustly denied proper medical care, and the reproductive capacity was shamelessly exploited by their merciless slaveholders. Most of the slaveholders deemed their health and well-being as inconsequential, leading to a complete disregard for their medical needs during childbirth. As a result, Female slaves were left to deliver their babies without any trained midwives or healthcare professionals to aid them. The absence of proper medical attention led to alarmingly high maternal mortality rates among female slaves. Complications during childbirth, like postpartum hemorrhage, infection, and vesicovaginal fistula, tragically claimed the lives of many, despite these deaths being preventable. The lack of medical expertise and resources left these women in incredibly vulnerable positions during one of the most critical moments of their lives. Many of these women had no choice but to rely on traditional home remedies and folk practices during childbirth. While some of these remedies might have provided limited relief, they were far from sufficient in addressing the medical expertise required during such a critical moment. This reliance on home remedies underscores the dire circumstances these women faced in their pursuit of essential health care. Things only got worse as the lack of health care and basic amenities for these slaves did not end with childbirth. Shockingly, they were expected to resume labor shortly after giving birth, leaving them with insufficient time to recover and putting both their own health and that of their newborns at risk. This practice not only hindered the bonding process between mothers and their infants, but also left these courageous women unable to provide the nurturing and care vital for the healthy development of their children. In some cases, many new mothers among the enslaved women were tragically separated from their own babies, being sold or given to white women as wet nurses to breastfeed white women's children. This heart-wrenching practice forcefully tore these women apart from their infants, 
resulting in numerous cases of infant deaths within the enslaved community. The challenge the postnatal healing process posed to these women gave them no choice but to rely on traditional African healing practices to address their healthcare needs. This included the use of medicinal plants, childbirth techniques, and dealing with the difficult conditions of vescovaginal fistula, which was rampant at that time. Medicinal plant usage was a cornerstone of African healing practices brought by female slaves from their homelands. They carried with them a wealth of knowledge about various plants with medicinal properties. These remedies were passed down through generations, forming an integral part of their healing traditions. In their new environment, they were made to adapt by identifying local plants with similar properties to those they knew from Africa. This created a fusion of traditional African medicine and new natural resources. However, VVF was a severe medical condition that many female slaves experienced as most of them were forced to get pregnant at a very young age. VVF occurred as a result of prolonged obstructed labor without proper medical intervention. In cases where childbirth was difficult or prolonged, the continuous pressure on the bladder and vagina led to the formation of a fistula, which is an abnormal opening between the bladder and the vagina. This caused persistent and uncontrollable urination, leading to additional suffering and isolation for those affected. Women afflicted with VVF were subjected to isolation and devaluation by their owners, who viewed them as useless due to their condition. In a cruel and exploitative manner, some slave owners sought to find a cure for VVF, not out of compassion for the suffering of these women, but to maximize their profits and exploit them further as property. Regrettably, Doctors and medical practitioners of that era demonstrated a shocking lack of concern and empathy for the healthcare needs of slave women, especially when it pertained to matters concerning their reproductive organs. This stands in stark contrast to the ethical principles of medical profession is meant to uphold. Many of the doctors considered examining and treating female organs as offensive and unsavory, which further compounded the already dire healthcare disparities faced by enslaved women. Amidst this distressing situation, Dr. James Marion Sims, who is often hailed as the father of modern gynecology, viewed these vulnerable female slaves as potential subjects for his experiments aimed at finding a cure for VVF. He exploited these women's bodies to advance his medical career by subjecting them to horrifying and brutal surgeries without anesthesia or their consent. Sims obtained consent solely from the slave owners for the surgeries. He assured them that he would not charge for his medical services, but he demanded that they continue to pay taxes on their slaves and provide clothing for them. Sims documented these operations in his autobiography, The Story of My Life, and in scientific papers that were published. He established a small hospital adjacent to his house, and between 1845 and 1849, Sims conducted a series of experimental vaginal surgeries on 12 black enslaved women suffering from VVFs. Among these women were Anarka, Lucy, and Betsy, aged between 17 and 19 years old, whose cases were vividly documented in Sims' book. These three women emerged as the most renowned cases that symbolized Sims' relentless pursuit of medical knowledge. These unfortunate women endured four harrowing years of being subjected to potentially life-threatening experiments, enduring excruciating pain throughout the process. During their stay at Sims Hospital, the enslaved women served a dual role, not only as patients, but also as laborers. They were assigned various tasks like cooking, cleaning, fetching water, and caring for children during their illness. This added burden compounded their already painful and distressing experiences while undergoing Sims' medical experiments. The first patient Dr. Sims operated on was 18-year-old Lucy, who had been experiencing uncontrollable bladder issues since giving birth a few months earlier. During the procedure, the patients were fully undressed and positioned on their knees, bending forward onto their elbows with their heads resting on their hands. Nearly a dozen other doctors observed the hour-long surgery, during which Lucy endured excruciating pain, screaming and crying out. 
Dr. Sims himself acknowledged in his book that Lucy experienced extreme agony. Unfortunately, Sims' controversial use of a sponge to drain urine away from the bladder led to severe complications for Lucy. She contracted blood poisoning and became extremely ill, prompting fears for her life. It took her two to three months to fully recover from the effects of the operation, which further highlight the immense pain and risk endured by the enslaved women who were subjected to Sims' experiments. In addition to stripping these women of their dignity, Dr. Sims also denied them anesthesia, thereby intensifying their already unbearable pain and suffering. While some doctors were skeptical about using anesthesia, Sims made the alarming choice not to employ any numbing techniques during his surgeries. His decision stemmed from a deeply misguided belief that black people didn't experience pain like white people did. Sims also claimed that anesthesia had not been developed during that time, but became available in the later years. However, when the anesthesia was available, he still refrained from using it, asserting that the kind of surgery he performed was not painful enough to justify the trouble or the risk. This stance is both shocking and ethically troubling, as it disregarded the immense suffering endured by the enslaved women subjected to his experiments. These statements by Sims present a total contradiction with his narrative about Lucy, who screamed in pain throughout the entire process. If the procedure truly lacked pain, as Sims described, there would be no reason for these women to cry out or scream in agony. This highlights the profound lack of empathy and the dehumanizing treatment to which these women were subjected. Sims' attitudes and actions reflect a troubling disregard for the pain and suffering endured by his patients, and his practices raise significant ethical concerns in the history of medicine till today. The most appalling aspect is that whenever any of Sims' patients died, he attributed the blame solely to the sloth and ignorance of their mothers and the black midwives who attended them. He refused to acknowledge any fault in his own methods and persisted in believing that his approach was flawless. For a long time, Sims' fistula surgeries were unsuccessful. He encountered numerous failures during operations of 17-year-old Anarka who would experience highly traumatic labor and delivery. It took him four years of experimentation to finally perfect his method. Afterwards, he started practicing on white women employing anesthesia during the procedures. Under Sims' care, Anarka endured an astonishing 30 surgeries without anesthesia, while Lucy underwent around 19 surgeries and Betsy faced approximately 11 surgeries. These women endured unimaginable pain, trauma, and suffering throughout the procedures. And once Sims eventually achieved successful outcomes, he sent them back to their masters. This shocking treatment shows the deep injustice and cruelty they endured, with no consideration for their well-being or rights even after serving as subjects for Sims' experiments. Sims' lack of concern for the pain and well-being of these enslaved women is evident in his own writings where he referred to them by their first names without acknowledging their humanity or the inhumane treatment they endured. This dehumanization of slave women underscores the profound racism and misogyny that influenced medical practices during that era. In his book, Sims openly describes how he always had an available subject for his operations, and that this period was the most memorable time of his life. This statement further illustrates the callousness with which he approached his experiments showing a complete disregard for the pain the woman endured for the advancement of his medical career. It is also on the record that many of the women on whom Sims experimented ended up with infections due to the injuries sustained during the operations. This was a result of the makeshift tools that Sim used throughout the entire process. He resorted to using the curved handle of a pewter spoon on a speculum, along with other makeshift equipment due to the lack of refined materials and proper tools during that time. As a result, the women subjected to these procedures faced potential complications and risk. It is also crucial to bear in mind that these surgeries were performed without the informed consent of the women. 
they had no say in determining what was done to their bodies throughout the entire process. After successfully discovering a cure for VVF, Sim established the Women's Hospital in New York. This hospital became a dedicated center for VVF treatment where he continued to perform surgeries. Dr. Thomas Addis Emmett served as his assistant and later became his successor in the hospital. While Dr. Sim's experiments are often depicted as pioneering breakthroughs in gynecology, it's important to acknowledge the significant toll they had on vulnerable and exploited enslaved women. Their suffering and sacrifices were exploited in the pursuit of medical knowledge, leaving a dark stain on the history of gynecology and shedding light on the grave injustices endured by the slave women during this troubling period. It is also crucial to note that before and after Sim's gynecological experiments, he tested surgical treatments on enslaved black children to treat trismus nasectium, also known as neonatal tetanus, with little success. Sims believed African Americans were less intelligent than white people due to their rapid skull growth. He operated on African American children using shoemaker tools to pry their bones apart and loosen their skulls, reflecting a deeply troubling and unethical aspect of medical history. In recent years, there's been increasing awareness of the unethical treatment of enslaved women like Anarka, Lucy, and Betsy. Amidst a series of protests, some states in the USA have removed Dr. Sim's statue and replaced it with a plaque acknowledging the exploitative medical experiments he conducted on women of color, honoring the three heroines involved. These actions aim to confront historical injustices and pave the way for a more compassionate and just future in healthcare and society. In 2006, the University of Alabama in Birmingham also took down the painting featuring Sims as one of the medical giants of Alabama. However, despite these revolutionary actions, statues of Sims still exist in various states in the U.S. and beyond. The case of Anarka, Lucy, and Betsy underscores the urgent need for inclusive medical history, one that confronts systemic injustices and exploitation faced by marginalized communities throughout history. These courageous women, along with countless others, have often been overlooked or overshadowed in traditional medical narratives, leading to a distorted understanding of the past. Inclusive medical history is vital as it gives a voice to those historically silenced and exploited in the pursuit of medical knowledge. When we focus on the stories of Anarka, Lucy, and Betsy, we acknowledge the significant contributions and sacrifices made by marginalized communities to the advancement of medicine, despite enduring unspeakable suffering. Celebrating and embracing the diversity of knowledge and experiences that have influenced our modern medicine is crucial for fostering a comprehensive understanding of healthcare. Over time, Numerous cultures and communities have contributed valuable insights and healing practices that have profoundly impacted medical progress. Embracing this diversity enables us to create a more inclusive, equitable, and efficient healthcare system. Therefore, the harrowing account of Dr. Sim's experiments stands as a chilling reminder for all of us to place ethics, empathy, and the sanctity of human life at the forefront of modern medical practice. As we recall this dark chapter in medical history, our goal is to prevent any recurrence of such atrocities and to ensure that such horrors are never repeated and that the pursuit of knowledge is always balanced with compassion and respect for every individual, regardless of their background or circumstance.